Restaurant Unstoppable, episode 707, with Kelly Malarney. I want to bite into, tell You're me. biting the holy chicken, which is our maple glazed fried chicken thigh. The holy chicken. With dripping a, all over the place. With a sunny side up egg, applewood smoked bacon, sriracha mayo, and some cheddar cheese. Is it all over my beer? Uh, sufficiently, over. as it should be. Mm. Yummy? Yeah. Well all done, right. man. All right. Delicious. With excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, Chef Kelly Malarney. My man, are you feeling unstoppable I today? I feel unstoppable. I cannot wait for this conversation. You have an incredible track record, but let me give the uh, listeners an idea of who we're talking to. Chef Kelly Malarney is a graduate from the Culinary Institute of America with nearly 40 years or over 40 years, somewhere around that line. Yeah, sadly, uh, <laughs> sadly over 40 years. Of, of experience working in or Opening or operating a successful restaurant today, Chef Kelly serves as the co-founder and chef of Bruxy. Bruxy is responsible for the original fried chicken and waffle sandwich, and each unique sandwich recipe was developed by Chef Kelly. Today, there are seven Bruxy locations in California and Nevada, and uh, 18 U.S. locations and 24 international locations, additional locations in development as we speak. Um, you just opened your franchise uh, operation, which is kind of exciting. I'm That's sure you right. guys are happy to get that rolling. I'm sure we'll learn more about that too. But before we dive into your story, let's get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling with a success quote or mantra. What do you got for us? Well, uh, lots and lots of quotes that I like to uh, try and live by, but one certainly is the life uh, is like an umbrella. It works best, or the mind is like an umbrella. Works best when it's open. Nice. Dive into that. Why is having an open mind so important? I just think you have to be open to listening to people and new ideas and trying things. And, uh, you know, we learn uh, more from failures and success. And if you're not willing to be open-minded and try some things and fall down and get back up, I think uh, I think success becomes problematic to some yeah, degree. Yeah, especially in this industry. And over the past 40 years, this industry has evolved so much. Oh. You would have been outdated a long time yeah, ago that's if right. you did not have an open mind. Yeah, I think people evolving. people have a lot of problem when they don't evolve and listen to what's going on yeah. and watch what's going on around them. I think it does become problematic. Awesome. Um, so i got to paint this picture real quick for our listeners. So if, you, if you're not watching this video, we're literally we're sitting right outside. Uh, this stand, was this, this must have been around before. Yeah, Bruxy. so this this is the original Bruxy location, and it was 420 square foot shack that was built in 1949. And while it's been many iterations over the years, it was a, it was a burger and soft serve stand back in the 50s. Nice. And it's so, so charming. Yeah, it is, it is charming. It's a charming neighborhood. It's a great area. There's lots of street energy, yep. as uh, you might get a little background noise. Which is why I'm giving people a heads up. Yeah, because <laughs> if we don't hear a siren during this podcast, I would be very surprised. Yeah, we're, we're literally on the street right now. You can hear the brakes screeching as we talk. So we're going to do our best to speak up. Uh, but uh, these mics are pretty badass. So I'm not too worried about it. Cool. Uh, so where does it make sense to start? telling your story well uh we, we can start from now and work backwards or start well, from the beginning start and work from forward the beginning. Like, when did you know this is your track i mean you must have had a good idea early on you yeah. went, invested in the cia well so i i uh i actually started working in a restaurant when i was about 12 back in the days when you worked in you know as kids <laughs> yeah. um so i started working in a restaurant when i was about 12 and that was a, a big job of mopping bathrooms and stocking shelves and yep. washing dishes and i'd always peer over into the kitchen and watch the cooks in there and, and after being there for about a year i think they let me you know trek into the kitchen kitchen a couple times and grill garlic bread it was an old steak and lobster nightclub that i worked in okay um and i did a little bit of bussing tables and things like that i took my stab at uh, playing football uh, my freshman year of high school and broke my arm so i couldn't play anymore oh. so i went back to work at a new restaurant uh, which I've worked at a, a couple times through my career called Harris Ranch. And oh, I really okay. got a great uh, a, a great overview uh, all of my tenure there. But there was a young chef there named Joey that uh, sort of inspired me. And I'd go back in the kitchen and I'd watch him. I was a busboy there. But I'd go back in the kitchen and I'd just watch him. And he had a great personality, a really great guy. Um, certainly an inspiration, a very young inspiration. He was, he was probably in his 20s. Um, and I just sort of uh, I, I tracked towards... Uh, moving from the front of the house to the back of the house. And uh, even in, even at that point in time, I think I was 14 or 15 years old, I was so anxious to make that transition that I volunteered without pay, uh, which, wouldn't be, which wouldn't be legal today. But uh, I People do it all the time. Yeah, I volunteered you know? uh, without pay to work a brunch one time when the chef was on vacation. I wanted to work with Joey in the kitchen. And from that point forward, I was pretty hooked. So 
let's paint the picture of well first of all what a great establishment to, to cut your teeth right or you know to sharpen your teeth yeah uh i think just getting started in the right establishment sometimes can give you like leaps and bounds of progress and you're you're 15 years old it kind of reminds me of malcolm uh, Gladwell's, I believe it was Malcolm Gladwell, his book uh, Outliers, mm-hmm. where it's just like the things that make these people, most people in life successful, just getting that early start and having that head start. I feel like you had a 10 year head start and most people getting into culinary. Maybe, school. maybe. Yeah, you know. Um, but what was it about Joey? Really dive into who he was. I yeah, believe he, well, he was he was young and so I could relate to him and he could relate to me. I okay. was 15, he was in his probably mid 20s maybe, but he has a very young, dynamic personality working in a kitchen yep. as a sous chef actually. Okay. Um, our chef was uh, was named Gertz Boy and he was a six foot four German chef um, and this was in the late 70s okay. so uh, um, he was a bit of a tyrant but actually I, be- I became really close to Gertz over the years and he's one of my biggest inspirations which I'm sure we'll talk about at some point okay um, but Joey just had a dynamic kind of magnetic personality and and I was I'm, I'm a pretty energetic very positive person okay and I think we just meshed and my interest in the kitchen um, you know attracted him and so I learned a bit from him and worked with him and and it was just an interesting transition just reflecting back at who he was how can we emulate how he was he, he seemed like he was very approachable and it seems like he saw something in you it seemed like he was he was encouraging something in you how can we recreate that and help somebody else be motivated well i think a lot of it has to do with a uh, positive attitude a lot of it has to do with open-mindedness mm, yeah um and some of the some of the things that i continue to live by um trying new things and and stepping out of the box i mean i was you know i was i was a, a bus boy and waiting on tables and super comfortable around people but there was something magical about kind of the back of the house and and uh, almost like being in the trenches like, yeah. well there was a camaraderie and it's definitely a different mentality and it always has been and always will be um but it was a little bit more about you know and i i did plays and things like that when i was in high school but there was and i was also a stage manager and and like doing the back of the house things so i think there's a common thread there i sort of yeah. liked i sort of liked creating the artistry not necessarily at the time being the being out in front as the actor, as it were. Okay. Um, and so maybe that maybe that's a common thread that just really appealed to me. Perhaps. So at this point, were you on board with the industry? Like, were you committed? I was. I was pretty well. I was committed. I was working. I worked all through high school, and I mean, when I talk about working, in my junior high school, I worked six days a week, six nights a week, and actually ran the the wow. steakhouse for Harris Ranch. Wow for the chef and that's why I eventually sort of became his sous chef while I was in high school. So you're talking about Chef Gertz? Chef Gertz, yeah. But Ann Harris who was the the founder of Harris Ranch and a wonderful woman, uh, intense woman, uh, she also took some interest in me and so my junior year into my senior year of high school she started dropping things on me like uh, pamphlets from Florida State uh, um, University which had a culinary program Cornell University and the CIA she started putting these things in front of me putting a bug in my ear they, they and, saw something in you yeah and, and, and have, I think it's so important when you see something in somebody to let them know they got it yeah because sometimes when we're so close we don't have that perspective I, I must sound like a broken record right now saying this so I say it often but it's so important to bring people's talents to the surface and to let them know because we need that guidance when we're young we don't we're, we're just like lost at that age it, you know? it was it, it was very helpful I was having a lot of fun working hard I yep. worked I worked hard at work and I worked hard at school and I was involved with school with other things as I said I did plays and was stage manager yep. in band um, I didn't play any more sports through high school but I was out supporting the sports teams I had some buddies that played football yep. so I was always out there with them um, but uh, I, I worked hard and and that's probably been one of my keys to my personal success I won't say that I'm successful but personally um, just I had a very strong work ethic yep. um, that was you know some of that certainly DNA uh, I had to I had to work uh, uh, my family didn't have a lot of money uh, my mom had a super strong work ethic and so that carried into my workplace and I think people saw that in nice me. so um, when did you commit to CIA what, what yeah so I, I applied to CIA uh, my senior year of high school I also was being pursued uh, by by more than colleges by the Navy because I was very good with math okay and I passed uh, passed the back in those days you know the draft was st- actually still in place I had to sign up for the draft okay and, and they came into the high schools We're and did, you now and did <laughs> testing and I, I signed up on April Fool's Day just so I could kind of try and make a joke out of it oh. <laughs> um, but uh, it is no joke but I had very high testing and my math scores and things so I was really trying to decide do I go into engineering or electronics or something like that but I'd already had almost four years of exposure and 
different experience in the restaurant business. And I got to tell you, it was a heck of a lot of fun. Yeah. And and that sort of took over. And, and I, I figured I could give a go with it. So I did apply to the Culinary Institute. I got accepted. And uh, that that was when I made the commitment. That was about January of 1981. And you're still at Harris Ranch at this point, right? Yeah, I was still at Harris Ranch. And you uh, to give a little bit of a teaser. You end up going back to Harris Ranch Harris 15 Ranch years later. And, Harris Ranch actually ended up getting me back out of culinary school. Uh, okay. My chef was leaving to go yeah, open. They were they were going to San Francisco to open something different, and and there was a family partying, and so they actually got me back to take his place at the ripe age of twenty. So you did two years culinary school, CIA. Um, you go back to Harris Ranch in 1981. In are you there for three years? I or? was there for four years, I believe, at that point. Okay, um, I'm 1983 because I graduated from culinary school in '83. Where you are, I mean, where I think the times are, have changed a lot back to the early '80s late 70s to where we are now knowing what you know about the industry would you recommend somebody go to culinary school as early as you did uh i would actually recommend they go get a year or two of experience okay. first yeah and you um, had experience so you're unique i had a lot of experience i certainly went in a to high school. functioning restaurant i certainly went to a school with a lot of people who didn't and i've had a lot of people come to me with that question and i've always advised if you want to get the most out of what you're spending for culinary school Go spend a year or two working first. Yes. It does two things. It helps you build a foundation for which to learn from and excel at in culinary school, mm -hmm. or it's going to tell you, eh, this career isn't for me, <laughs> yes. and I'm going to save a lot of money so and put it something important. else. Yeah. And, and I've had both things happen. I think it's super, super important. I think seven, I personally just think, for my own life experience, I think 17, 18 years old is too young to be making life investments, especially in today's age, where it's going to cost you upwards 50 or even as many as like $200,000, maybe not for culinary, but for a degree. Figure out what you want to do. There's no yeah. rush. Figure it out. Yeah, I, a lot of parents uh, cringe when I say this, but I have a, I have a couple of nieces. Um, I have a few nieces, actually. And I've tried to recommend them when they were younger not to be in such a rush not to be in such a hurry take a year off of either between between high school and yeah. college or do some do a little college and then yeah. take a year and really try and figure out who you are and what you want to be because you're really trying to make a commitment to life and and there's a lot of time mm -hmm. there's a lot of time plus we're living like 20 years longer it's on average exactly we, the conversation we, we I had with, <laughs> yeah. exactly the conversation I had with my niece recently who's in nursing school but I told her just relax a little bit because you've got you're gonna be working till yeah. you're 70 or 80 yeah. probably <clears throat> a year or two of trying to really figure out which direction you want to go isn't going to hurt. Is it worth talking about the CIA? Were there any key mentors, any key experiences that you think have had an impact on you to this day? Uh, I think all of it had had an yeah. certainly had every every experience, good or bad, and and everybody should take this to heart. Any experience, good or bad is experience. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have to be open-minded. Um, I remember when I was getting ready to move out of the country, I had some chef friends who for, were from other countries who basically said that to me, Kelly, it might be a good experience, maybe a bad experience to move to, to Ireland. It's going to be an experience. You should yeah. do it anyways. Yeah. And that, I really took that to heart. Um, culinary school had a great impact on me in a lot of different ways. I met a lot of, I met a lot of great people. I also saw things that I wouldn't want people to do or that, mm -hmm. that uh, have given me some advice to give to people who are going to culinary school. Give me an school. example. Well, I mean, I had people in my class that, 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 that didn't know how to cook, yeah. you know, and you, you know, you befriended some and you kind of helped them carry them, carry themselves through and others you just got frustrated with because they were dragging things down. Yeah. No offense to anybody, but it's the experience thing, which you, yeah. which you mentioned. Get a little experience before you make that decision, that commitment. So you graduate CIA, you go back to um, Harris Ranch in in restaurant uh, now are you running this, this the place or what's going yeah on? so my as i said gertz was leaving and so he had recommended they get me back to take over for him which was kind of interesting i mean at the time i was still i was only 20 years old so um, back in those days by the way the drinking age in new york was 18 when i moved there 19 the following year and when i moved back to california i was underage and couldn't drink no wonder why anymore. you're having so much fun <laughs> so um <laughs> But I, I came back and I took over for Gertz. But the nice thing was was the the family that had taken over Harris Ranch, the John Harris and his wife Carol, um, they were they wanted to expand the the restaurant, and so we uh, I got the opportunity immediately to start working on a new banquet kitchen, which I got to get into kitchen design. Um, and then we opened a hotel, which is still there today, and it's a great hotel. Um, I don't know if you've been. You sound familiar with it, but it's an awesome property. Um, so I got, uh, during that four years, I not only ran at the time, and keep in mind this is the early 80s, I ran about eight and a half, nine million dollar food and beverage operation, expanded it into a bank facility and a hotel. Are you talking about King Seafood right now? No, no, no. No, no I'm, ta still I'm still talking Harris, okay, Harris okay, Ranch. Okay. Yeah. Wow, wow. Yeah. So I, uh, we, there was some growth and some expansion there. 
I learned a ton during that. I period. want to pull back the layers on that, but before we dive into that expansion, the the, the hard lessons you learned, we got to hover over uh, Gertz. Am I saying it right? Yeah, Gertz. Gertz. Um, you said earlier that he had a huge influence on you. He did, and I didn't know it when I was working for him in high school. I mean, he was Hindsight he was in twenty twenty. Yeah. Well, I mean, he just there was things he taught me, things that I learned. We worked hard. I mean, he and I were 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 friendly, and we went skiing together and did some things together when when I was in my later years of working with him. Um, but I didn't really realize the impact and influence he would have on me until later later in life. What and, is that impact? Like- uh, well, uh, first of all, one of the things he told me when I was going away to culinary school was everything you've learned here, put in the back of your mind and be open to listen to yes. others. Super important. Um, I learned a lot about production and speed from him. He wasn't a creative chef. He was able to crank it out and, and An work hard. Chef. He was very efficient and worked really hard. Later in my career, um, I would always go into the restaurant to be some of the first people into the restaurant. And I'd be in there and I'd go through the walk-in every day and clear the walk-in out and organize it. And I remember back in the days when I'd walk in and see him doing that at 7 o'clock in the morning, just plowing through stuff and making sure everything was fresh and rotated and things. And those were things I remember seeing, but it didn't have the impact until later when it just became my practice. It's low road communication. It's not directly being communicated to you, but you're observing it and it, the, the actions are communicating to you that this is the standard. Yeah, and and I had the benefit uh, just a couple of years ago, actually, to, um, I, hadn't, I hadn't seen, I'd seen Gertz a few years, a few times through the years, but in the, probably somewhere in the 90s, I sort of lost track. And I had the benefit a couple of years ago, I was actually up in San Francisco doing Escape from Alcatraz uh, triathlon, and I went into Harris's, which was the restaurant that he and Ann Harris went and did, and I left a note for him. I, I, I guess I had matured. And I left a note, and actually he reached out to me, and I had the benefit a couple months later of sitting down and having dinner with him and, and telling him what an influence he That's was. That's awesome. It was, and it was uh, how many years later? Almost 40 years later, 35 years later. Um, it, was, it was awesome to just sit down and say, you really need to understand the influence that you did have on me. Yeah. So it was very cool. You reminded me, I can't believe I'm about to quote Kanye West right now, but uh, <laughs> he has this line in one of his songs that... Too often people don't get the flowers or get the flowers after it's too late. Yeah. Right. And if somebody has an impact on you, if they if they influence you, like let them know. And that that's kind of the idea. Like usually you get pl- somebody flowers during the funeral. Right. right. Give, right, give them right. the flowers when yeah. they're still around to to let them know that they had an impact. Yeah. In their life. It was really fun to sit down. We had dinner at Harris's and just sat and talked for hours, and it was really it was really fun to do that. Nice. Um. So what were you said that you really expanded uh, Harris Ranch and you took it to the next level? Yeah. I'm sure you learned a lot through that experience. What were some of the trials and tribulations? Well, I mean, doing a kitchen design for the really for the first time, you uh, you, you definitely make mistakes and you, you try and try and rectify those. Um, it was just a really good growth period uh, to to sit here 40 years later and try and rattle off the trials and tribulations. There's probably too many to count, yeah. um, but I I definitely worked hard to try and make it happen and. You know, building a hotel and learning a little bit about that business and, and kind of how you expand and, and marketing and all, all of those things. They really helped me later in life, I think, uh, under, understand uh, how you grow how you grow business and that there are trials and tribulations and mistakes going to be made and to try and be proactive and thoughtful about what you're doing. Um, in, in carpentry, I think they say measure twice and cut once. Yeah. Um, so it, it taught me a little bit about measure twice and cut once. Yep. Don't, don't just leap into things. So do you maybe measure once and cut once? Well, I or think twice. I, 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 I think I've learned to really double check and, and yeah. try and make sure that you're being very strategic and proactive. Especially with the restaurant space, because of efficiency, ergonomics, all these things, like it's really a thoughtful process. It should it, be at least. It should be. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we have so much to unpackage. You have a, such an incredible career. I don't want to skip over Harris Ranch. Any issues or real big lessons learned before we move on to the next well when we come in there's there's another point of harris ranch later in my life so maybe we'll just pop back to it yeah we'll come back around so why did you leave yeah so i i I actually got the uh benefit of going on a trip in i think it was 1986 or 7 i can't remember what year it was eight maybe 87 um and uh i went with a chef traveling through asia we went to uh, Tokyo, to Hong Kong, uh, Thailand, and uh, Singapore. Nice. And we did some traveling for about three weeks, and, and it really started to open up my mind to the fact that, okay, uh, I need to get out and broaden my horizons a little bit. Mm. And so when I came back, I just decided that it, had, it was time for me to package everything up and maybe move to the big city. Um, at the time, that was L.A., 
Um, even you though, were in New York. <clears throat> well, I lived in I lived lived in upstate New York when I was in culinary school, but I grew up in the Central Valley of California. Okay, gotcha. And actually, San Francisco was what I would consider my home city. Gotcha. <clears throat> but um, I had some contacts actually through some executives at Harris Ranch. They put me in some contact uh, down in Los Angeles. So I moved down. I had a buddy that had moved down there. So I moved down and just uh, was going to start over. Yeah. I was 23 or 24 at the time and ready to start over. So getting out there and just getting that experience, right, and and finding out what truly lights you up, uh, it's so easy to get comfortable, you know, and just trying not to be comfortable. Uh, And I would even recommend doing what you did at this point when you're 24 after you graduate high school and figuring out what it is about and then being really intentional with the rest of your career. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I agree with that. You need, you, you have to, you have to continue to educate yourself in whatever means and means and ways possible. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Yeah. Um, I, I personally have found a passion for travel and that trip definitely solidified that also during that period at Harris ranch. I, again, with a bunch of young, uh, thank you. With a bunch of uh, young chefs, we started the American Culinary Federation uh, of the San Joaquin Valley, and I got around a bunch of other chefs who had 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 some different exposure, and so I was there was great camaraderie with them. Mm-hmm. But I was also learning that mm, I need to broaden my horizons, and we did we used to do a bunch of dinners together and charity dinners and yeah. things like that together. And so it really that and and that trip with my with my buddy Greg uh, Greg Vartanian, I'll mention him, Visalia, California. Um, he was a uh, he was an in, in Inspiration. I don't know so much a mentor as an inspiration. How did he inspire you? Uh, I, he just was a really, he was a very talented cook, okay. chef, but cook, restaurateur. Um, and he and I befriended each other and did a lot of projects together. And um, I think he challenged me uh, and maybe I challenged him to become better. And we traveled on that trip together. We went to Asia on that yeah. trip together. And it just taught me that I, you know, he was a little bit older, a few years older than me. And it just taught me that I, I really needed to get out and open my mind so I could continue to grow. Mm. And growth was super important to me at the time. So how, what was the, the, the <clears throat> biggest way in retrospect, looking back at that time, how did you grow the most during that time? Um, well, certainly opening my eyes to different culinary techniques Cultures. And, and, and then and then culture. And culture was, a, 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 again, going that trip just opened my mind to, um, to different cultures, different cuisines, um, a, lot of, a lot of different things. And so I've, I've continued from that point forward to travel. I travel a lot. Okay. So eventually you <laughs> found yourself at King Seafood yeah. uh, Company, which was then known as University Restaurant Group? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Um, so they had a restaurant, they had a restaurant in uh, Long Beach at the time. Okay. So uh, at this point, have you fe- do you feel like you're pretty much on a, a path? Like you, you got your experience, you traveled, you you absorbed a lot of different techniques. Actually, actually, I kind of felt like I was going to go take a couple steps back and and uh, rebirth myself and and, and grow myself because I figured I'm going to the city now. Uh, maybe maybe at Harris Ranch, I was a little bit of a bigger fish in a smaller okay. pond, perhaps, yeah. and that's what I wanted to get out of. I wanted to challenge myself nice. and stretch myself out. And coming to the, coming to Los Angeles was was a scary affair, to yeah. be honest with you. Um, I I guess I was lucky in the sense that I there was a couple of connections that were made through some executives at Harris Ranch. It put me in touch with some very good people. Okay. And then at the time, I met Jeff King. I was looking at some different opportunities, but I met with Jeff King. And yeah. I, I got to tap the brakes just because of how how <clears throat> important it is to get outside of your comfort zone. Oh yeah. That's well. that's where growth happens. Yeah. And push yourself. Get get uncomfortable. Push yourself in strange situations. That's that will pay you. That will pay you back. Tenfold. We could have we could have probably a very long conversation about getting out of your comfort zone yeah. and being uncomfortable because yeah. um, as I as I talked to you a little bit earlier, I do triathlon. Yeah. And you want to talk about having to get get uncomfortable yeah. in order to progress? I'm I'm I'm, I'm uncomfortable thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but but I think I'm I think I'm I'm. I'm comfortable getting uncomfortable in, yeah. in my new sport because I think that was something that I felt okay with mm. doing. And I knew I needed to. I knew I just I, I needed to stretch my wings and grow a little bit. And so I, I got lucky enough to, uh, to get an interview with, with University Restaurant Group. And I went through an interview process, and I, I had to go audition and cook for them at, at their restaurant in Long Beach. And they had just opened a seafood restaurant in Santa Monica at that time. And uh, I had spent a stint... Um, doing seafood up at uh, Salishan Lodge in my externship, actually in uh, Oregon. Okay. So I had uh, I had a bit of exposure to some great seafood and some great chefs and great interns. I spent uh, four or five months up there um, over the summer of I think '82, 
And that was another great exposure for me to be about around a bunch of talented young people who were all grappling for position. Yeah. That was a horse race, and everybody was grappling for position. Are you position. talking about your time in Oregon? Yeah, in okay. my time in Oregon. Okay. Um, that, w- that was a learning experience, and I think that's what also uh, stuck with me. With, with Just for the listeners so they know, this is while you're at the CIA, you did your externship. In, yeah, at Talishan Lodge, yeah. and, and it, was a great, it was a great experience. And it, it was educational in the sense that, again, it's a bunch of people that are in there doing internships and and vying for position yeah, and, and to, it was very competitive it was yeah. very very competitive and i actually i actually held my own nice yeah and i think just the power of being around other like-minded driven people is so significant because you're it's, the average of those you surround yourself it's with. it's critical um so 1987 is when you joined a king seafood yep. company uh it took you three years to become a partner yeah how how do you go from just you know auditioning and in three years having skin in the game? Yeah, so that's a great. It is a great question, and and again, I'm I'm lucky or or it, it was a great opportunity for I me. I don't believe in luck. Um, well, <laughs> luck is usually when opportunity meets preparedness, yes, right? Yes. Um, so I I joined them at, at a time when it was very critical for their second restaurant, which was Ocean Avenue Seafood in Santa Monica, and I went in and there was some changes, and I think they had strategically uh, decided. To, to make some changes and, and put me in charge. I wasn't hired to take over that restaurant, but it was a matter of weeks and I was in, in the role of executive chef. So I think it was strategic because I had run a big operation. Got you. Again, I wasn't the most creative chef. I was I was scratchy and got into the trenches and could crank out food and, and organize operations. And that's all the stuff I learned from Gertz mm. and my time at, at uh, Harris Ranch. So give me one lesson about organization, operations that you... That you picked up from Gertz and that you leveraged to make you successful. Well, I think I think I think being certainly being prepared uh, for game day makes you a lot more successful What's with the outcome. Look like? Uh, I think organization, working hard, working hard in advance of service. I'm still an advocate this these days of when you come in, if you don't drag your feet. You come in hustling and you hustle those first few hours and you really get the restaurant set up and prepared. So then you're taking a deep breath and looking around and going, okay, what can I fine tune before the guests come mm-hmm. in? And, and that way we're not scrambling for the guests. We're mm-hmm. actually focused and hyper focused on quality and putting product yeah. on a plate. In, in aviation, they call us being ahead of the airplane because you as you're flying, because I have a background in commercial aviation. Uh-huh. As you're flying, you don't have time when you're setting up the approach, when you're flying the approach, to be putting uh, frequencies in the, 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 the radio or dialing in uh, ILS or like whatever. Like you got to have all that lined up, your situational right. awareness lined up so you can fly into it ready to go. Because yep. and, and, you can't go backwards. You can't turn around. And right? it makes it a whole lot more comfortable. Yeah. I mean, it makes yep. it a whole lot more comfortable. You go into service and you're scrambling or you're, you're try, still trying to fill this hole and that hole and heat up this thing and that thing, uh, you know, start behind, stay behind. And, yeah. and I just don't believe in that. So yeah. it was really about getting everybody organized and getting everybody set and ready to go. Um, uh, p- being positive, pumping everybody up. I feel like when you're a leader, you have to be a, a coach, a cheerleader. Uh, you have to be willing to get in and be the captain of the team when it's necessary. Yeah. You got to be a lot of different things. And you also have to be the person who absorbs stress for the team mm. um, and not project it out. Um, so so that was sort of the role I filled. I want to get into that. But first, we got to take a break to thank our sponsors. We'll be right back. This episode brought to you by Margin Edge. Never deal with a paperwork nightmare again. All right, we are back, and um, you said something just before the break that really resonated with me in absorbing the stress for the team. Um, that's really significant, not easy to do. So how do you do that gracefully? How do you? What, what advice do you have for yeah, being so, a leader? Uh, so I think that I, 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 will, I will say that I'm not sure that that was my primary focus in my early 20s, yeah. um, but as I matured a little bit into my mid to later 20s, I realized that stressing, stressing out and stressing the team out was counterproductive. And that to be a good leader, I really needed to absorb the absorb the stress and keep my team even keel, <clears throat> so they could perform at their best level. Yeah. What does absorbing the stress look like? Well, just uh, I mean, if uh, if something goes wrong on the line, or 
or you know the front of the house decides they're going to slam us or something happens uh, you just got to you just got to try and control the environment Contr- I, i'm very fond of saying and if you talk to any of the managers here they could tell you one of my mantras is control what you can control okay so as as things are firing in at us it's it's a bit like it's a bit like taking flack um, and just trying to have everything aimed at you so your team can stay under control and then you got to kind of take a couple deep breaths and maybe swallow a little bit of that and then just try and intensify the team. Um, but uh, there's another quote that I might mess up, but I've always found it to be more effective and to get more out of people by, by sort of igniting an inferno within them versus trying to light a fire under their ass. As yes, so. yes, I love that. And um, this mentality of, um, of absorbing, and it, it, don't, what I'm thinking of is the... the the idea of being proactive versus reactive, um, letting acting on the world instead of letting the world act yeah. on you. Yeah. You know what I 100%. mean? It's just kind of how I'm processing yep. that. Yep. Um, okay, so any other big lessons? I mean, I'm curious. What what was the state of business um, of King Seafood yeah. in 1985, and where was it when you left in 1994? Yeah. So Ocean Avenue Seafood was their second restaurant, and okay. it was doing phenomenal business like okay. over the top I, th- I think probably way more than they had anticipated mm-hmm. um it was a bit chaotic at the time and I think uh, chaos is underrated though. <laughs> well it was chaos there was good chaos and there's bad chaos yeah um and so we got uh, within a pretty short time period we kind of reorganized the team in the back of the house and got a new got a new sous chef for me um and kind of leveled out the the team got things organized and in the first year I was there, we, we really managed to do a lot of volume. And I'm not going to throw out numbers, um, but at the time in 1980, whatever that was, seven or eight, that would have been 88. 87 at this time. to 94. Yeah, this, is this would have been 88. Uh, we had a very significant year, uh, and it turned out to be a very profitable year. Um, and so it was good for me because, uh, you know, I made, a, I made a mark on the company. We really, they had a very good culture in the sense of of what what they wanted the business culture to be and i think it meshed well with me and i learned a lot natural about natural alignment it was natural alignment but i also learned a lot from some people there and there are a couple people in that organization that i would also put out there as inspirations to me anything that's worth bringing to the surface that you can share with my listeners and well as we're telling the story the idea is like people are out there going through what you went through 30 years ago and learning from your mistakes anything that you you wish you did different back then or a person perspective that somebody gave you that you can share with the rest of the audience yeah so um wished i did different i mean there's probably a lot of things i wish i had done different yeah. but then but then again you look back and you go you know that's well, you natural growth. You are too. yeah that's yeah. natural growth i think the, again being open-minded and being willing to learn and change and adapt mm. is super important and yeah. adaptability by the way along with evolution is obviously super important otherwise yeah. uh, things uh um, disappear. Um, so I, uh, I, we, we had a great year there and, and you'd ask me about, um, becoming a partner in the company. Um, I think because I was, I worked all the time again, work ethic, uh, didn't bother me. So I worked all the time. And when it came time to start talking about, um, new restaurants that they were looking at doing, you know, they tapped me to go on R and D trips, research development trips and things like that. And so I got to, I got the benefit of being involved in a growing company at an early stage and I had something to contribute. And, and they saw that again, much like Ann Harris and Gertz saw, saw me at that time. I had something to contribute. Again, I was very positive, constructive, um, listened and what do you and, mean by constructive? Give us an example of what it means to be constructive. Well, so if I didn't necessarily agree with something, I, I mean, I, I was not afraid to speak my mind. How do you do that tastefully and not in a way that pisses anybody off? Well, that's the thing, right? Be a problem solver, not a problem finder. Yeah. Um, And so, you know, I would offer, if I didn't agree with something, I generally offer some kind of solution or some kind of something. You're not just bitching. You're being proactive. Yeah. You need to, you need to come to me with solutions. If you, if you want to, if you want to use the word, so if you want to bitch at me, then bitch at me and then tell me what you're going to do about it. Yeah. Uh, You know, finding, finding problems is really easy. Yeah. This is, this is striking near to home right now because I recently just had somebody on the show and we were talking about all these different uh, tips for success in the restaurant industry and one of the things was you know treat it like you own it but don't forget that you don't own it yeah and you have to be mind like you want to have that ownership you want to you want to hustle like you own it because you will someday create opportunity for yourself you're living proof of that but at the same time you have to be tactful because you can't be a d-bag about it too like you got to remember that somebody else owns this and you got to respect that presentation and timing is often very important how you present things and the timing of when you present things 
things. And again, if you've got a counter argument, have a counter argument, but have a solution and be willing to understand why somebody else might want to do things. Mm. You know, you talk about ownership. Uh, I, I've always had that sense of ownership. I mean, I did have my own. I'm, I had paper routes when I was a kid, so I owned those. And yeah. one of the hardest things in my life was giving up my paper route because it was giving up my mm. customers. Um, it was very difficult when I was, I think I was 13 when I had to give up my paper route and train somebody to take over my paper route that I had had for six years Ooh. <laughs> at that point, 12 or 13. Um, so I've, I've always had that sense of ownership and that's benefited me. Uh, when I when I went to University Restaurant Group, I had that sense of ownership. Again, yes. they saw that. And I did have a conversation one time with, uh, with Sam King, who is a, a I'll say an, a friend and still a mentor to this day. He's the he's the, the founder and, and CEO of, of King's okay. Seafood Company. I um, mean, I'm still in, in touch with him on a regular basis. We go to lunch once or twice a year, probably, and talk periodically. Um, but I did kind of say to him as we were getting ready to do some different restaurants at Harris Ranch, we uh, John Harris had set up a profit sharing plan, which uh, you know is a big corporation. Yep. And I, you know, I was pretty young; I didn't really know w- what exactly that meant at the time. But I knew I had it, so a certain amount of money. It's possible. They a yeah. certain amount of money they they contributed based on the percentage of what you were making, mm-hmm. and and so I kind of learned that. And so I asked. I asked them, what are you going to do during the growth to, to, to keep people uh, on board and to ensure that, that good people stay with you? You're going to have some kind of profit sharing. You're going to have some kind of ownership plan. I asked the questions. Okay. So I think that's really important. Um, mm-hmm. and the way you do that, I think is really great. You're not demanding it. You're just inquiring about what's your plan. Uh, what's my future look like? What's yep. the plan? And you're, you're planting the seed and letting people know that you have interest in more. Yeah. And you, you got to kind of manifest these things. you gotta, you got to make these things happen yep. by putting it into the universe right yep. i guess i guess i could throw another quote out you yeah, yeah, that please. i love you we're probably going to come up with a lot of them i don't know if that's a i'm sorry i have Drop a lot of quotes us, man. i actually love quotes me so, too um but there's a time to let things happen and a time to make things happen yeah. and, and to truly be successful you have to make things happen yeah in but, my belief but that's the secret this is probably one of my biggest aha moments the the most successful brands out there the reason why they're successful is because they to make it about creating opportunity for others. And they know that this yep. person that I've groomed, that I've invested in, that I put money and time into, sent around the country or the world to research is going, they're taking all these lessons. That I've I've groomed them. They're going to go on and do their own thing. Why not let them do their thing? But why not I invest in that thing with them? Why not yeah. I why not I prime their the rest of their career? Yeah, right? and if and if the if the synergy is right, it's a symbiotic relationship and and the business then benefits from all of that learning and, and adapting and growth and, and all of those things as well. And that's what happened to me with University Restaurant Group, with, with Ocean Avenue Seafood and, and URG and, um, and now King Seafood. Um, so we, I, I was able to get involved in the design, conception, all of those things in the very early stages with this whole team of people. Okay. Brilliant people, designers. Uh, the general manager that I worked for, Michael Fink, uh, was a, was an early in- inspiration to me in a lot of ways. Um, Sam King, Jeff King, those guys, they were just open-minded. Jimmy Sands was the chef that hired me. He eventually left the company, but he was a great guy that saw things in me that that, uh, he, that he needed to help him um, with some of the things he wanted to get done, and, and, it, and it helped me in my growth. We're learning so much in this conversation, but I really want to make sure that we spend time on what you got going on today. Um, talking about modern-day scale, this is your first uh endeavor into franchising so maybe some of the lessons you're learning there but i don't want to cut you short i mean it, time now is 1994 you, you had a you went back to harris ranch in 1994 to 1997 from 97 to i think 2000 you were doing some other stuff i know you opened a, a restaurant with michael jordan in chicago yeah uh where does it make sense to go next i mean you bring us to well the, the so most so we talked point. a lot about harris ranch john john harris reached out to me um in uh, i think it was early 94 just looking to get uh, get somebody that he trusted to come back as a food and beverage director and help uh, sort of help redirect maybe some things that had gone awry. Uh, so we didn't need to spend a ton of time. That was that was a great learning experience too. I mean, I took a lot of front of the house uh, um, information with me. I I sort of redirected some of their um, kitchen operations to make sure we were maintaining quality. Um, I learned a little more about business probably at that point okay. uh, with them. Um, but I'd committed two years to them and, and spent three. And Harris Ranch is in the middle of 
the, the, the San Joaquin Valley. I just spent six, seven years down in Los Angeles where yeah. there's a little bit more going on. Yeah. Um, and I was craving getting back to the city and, and getting some things done. So at that time, I, I decided it was time to move on. And Do I you feel like you owed it, owed it to them by any chance? I'm just uh, curious about that. I don't know about owed it to them, but the fact that they, they, they sought me and I was a little bit burned out in Los Angeles. Yeah. So the timing was good for me. Um, and you know, they made me a, a, a nice offer to, uh, to come back and it was, it, it was another growth vehicle. I felt yeah. I would learn some things. We well, got to think about this. Like they invested in you. They set you on this trajectory. I mean, you took this trajectory, but they saw something in you and they encouraged you and they coaxed this out of you. Like, would you have been where you were at, um, King seafood? If not for them, you got to wonder these things. Yeah. Well, I think they all, they're all connected. I yeah. think they are all connected. So I, I didn't feel an obligation, but they certainly made it worth my while to make a move and so but it's amazing when people take care of you how you are inclined to go back to those to take care of those who took care of you yeah, right I'd, I'd say that's accurate yeah um at the point that uh, i'd been there for a few years um it was time to move on and i knew some people up in san francisco and san francisco as i said has sort of always been my heart home city and so i went up there and i did some work around there but i didn't really find a home there and about six months eight months into that um, I was sought after by a couple different recruiters, a, kind of a new experience for me because I'd, 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 I'd never really worked with recruiters and been in that world before. So I went and did more auditions and more cooking. And, and then it became a little bit of, wow, I get to, not only am I being made offers, but now I get to select who I want to go work with. Um, and I, I had one really good offer with a, with a very well-known, actually famous chef uh, company. Um, which would have been interesting. It was actually Wolfgang Puck Foods at the time. Oh, wow. Um, and, uh, and then suddenly I got uh, contacted by the House of Blues um, out of Chicago. And I knew some people that worked with the House of Blues. And they flew me out to Chicago. And I walked into that, uh, that space. Um, and I was intrigued. Uh, again, it was a little bit of a spreading of the wings, taking a new leap into something different. Uh, they wanted to hire me as a director of operations. So it wasn't okay. a culinary job. It was actually a front of the house job. Okay. Um, overseeing everything. And uh, that seemed like the bigger leap. And so I decided to take that leap. And so I ended up moving to Chicago. And I spent a year, which uh, at, the, at the House of Blues at that time, uh, it was about like five years because we yeah. were we were in at seven in the morning and I'd be there oftentimes till two in the morning till the club closed. Yeah. But I feel like if you took that opportunity with Wolfgang Puck, you might have been shadowed. It's yeah. It, who knows? I mean, they you know they they wanted me to. Uh, I was going to be a, a regional chef for uh, the cafes, and I, I don't know. Again, I cooked for them. I cooked for a bunch of them, and they they liked me. They made me the offer, and um, and uh, this other thing came along, and it just. It seemed more intriguing, and part of it was they wanted to put me um, here in Southern California, which is where they were based. And I think I was ready to move on to something different. I okay. just uh, I just needed to to branch out a little more. Okay. So I mean, they're a great company and remain a great company. It just wasn't something. It wasn't a turn I wanted to make. It was a fork in the road, and I had to I had to pick a direction. And it, it seemed like the bigger challenge and the bigger leap. To be honest with you, was this like your first real true like corporate role too? Yeah, truly, yes, it was actually. Which has probably helped set you up for this. this success you're having now and scaling into getting because you're you're kind of heading in that direction with what you got with Brex. yeah i would say that it uh it teaches you a couple things it teaches you how to deal in the corporate environment and it also for somebody like me who's very independent and and not necessarily molded into a corporate world it also teaches you that maybe the corporate world isn't for me and if i'm going to build a business i want to be uh i want to be cognizant of that so we don't create um maybe some of those corporate uh roadblocks yeah. that happen so what did you learn about yourself during this time what did you learn about the corporate world that i mean what, what advice can you have for somebody transitioning to that that environment i i think it's good to learn structure yes discipline um hierarchy and and how to navigate and manage through those processes um but again i'm an extreme independent individual and so i learned about myself that that's it's a challenging environment for me personally what was most challenging for you um I guess not. Uh, you really have to fight through a lot of stuff to be heard. Bureaucracy. Um, yeah, and, I, and, and it's necessary in some cases. Um, the creative side. I was going through a phase of really needing to branch out creatively. 
Um, and so I, I, I learned that I missed the, the, attach, the direct attachment to culinary. Mm. Um, I love that. And, and that goes back to my youth when I, when I first was in the front of the house and kind of had to, and wanted to transition to the back of the house. I, I feel more comfortable and confident uh, managing the entire business from, from I used to say I, I feel more comfortable managing the business in my white coat, okay. in my chef coat. Um, so I, I learned a lot about that, but it was a great experience. I met some great people. I'm friends to, to this day uh, with some of the executives that were worked for the House of Blues at that time. I have a very good friend who runs a business out in Brooklyn that uh, we, we connect regularly. Um, so it, it was a great experience. Yeah. So anything, I mean, is it worth talking about your, your restaurant uh, with Michael Jordan? So during that time, actually, I had a manager that worked for me that left and went to work for the, the management company that, that ran Michael Jordan's restaurants. Okay. There was a Michael Jordan's restaurant in uh, that was sort of a sports theme restaurant in Chicago. But he also had uh, 160 Blue, which was the fine dining restaurant. Okay. That they put in. I never a, knew Michael Jordan was a restaurant tour. Yeah, so he, <laughs> you know, he had the branded one that was really about the branding yeah. and Michael Jordan, but he wanted to open a fine dining restaurant. Okay. Um, and by the way, super nice guy. Um, and so the management, the the management company was looking for somebody to come in and, and take over as a manager, the general manager for 160 Blue, and the gentleman who used to work for me recommended me. So I went and met with David Zydekoff, a great guy, hospitality guy. Um, South African, actually, really, okay. really great guy, and loved David and, and learned a lot of things from David. He and I hit it off, and he wanted me to. They had a great chef. Um, Patrick was a very good chef, but their operations were a little uh, not in sync with the kitchen operations. Okay. And so he wanted to bring in somebody with uh, maybe the ability to sort of synchronize and work with Patrick. Okay, so take take us through what that looks like: getting the front of house and the back of house synchronized yeah so striking up a relationship and having a rapport with a very talented creative chef um, being a not being so ego maniacal myself that I could deal with an ego like Patrick's and Patrick did have, did have an ego um, maybe rightfully so he's a very very talented yep. gentleman um, and and just being able to talk on the same level and actually really try and Try and just lay the groundwork without having a conversation about it, lay the groundwork that, hey, I am here to ensure that whatever you're putting up in this window is getting served to the guest in the best way possible. So We're, the best way to bring these the, the, these groups together is to let them know that you're on their side. Yeah, it's really about uh, getting everybody in the boat together. Mm. I mean, I, I, I don't even want to say that there's sides. Let's all get in the boat yeah, together because the, really the end game, the end game with, with the restaurant business period, the, the end game isn't about front of house, back of house, or us and them. It's really about us trying to exceed the guest yes, expectation there is no we there's just uh, or there's no you and me there's we yeah it's it's really about all of us getting together to exceed the guest expectation of the guests that's what it really comes down to and that, that, that's what we have to get everybody's mind around yeah is it we're, we're serving the guests it's not us them twist that mic right into your face real quick yep, sorry no you're good you're good keep them going it's not a, it's, it's so it's really about the guests the yeah. bottom line is about the guests so my my role in that situation was just to connect with patrick have a relationship with patrick i also had to do a lot of work with the wine list the wine list uh, from the previous manager that had been there really didn't match patrick's food because they didn't have a good relationship yeah so you had a bunch of funky it's amazing how this thing compounds right yeah. when when the relationships the human relationships are there the the brand gets misconceived yeah. like all these things start to diverge there has to be synchronicity yeah for sure so i i went in and really worked on the service and and got them uh, awards for the service level. Brought them up to a uh, four star, five star, whatever whatever it was at the time, nineties, um, um, and really worked hard on the wine list and getting the wine list to match Patrick's food. Okay. And by match it, I don't only mean in taste profile and everything else, but it needed to match the personality of the restaurant. Mm. Um, it needed to be contemporary and forward and have some obscurity to it, um, because Patrick was Patrick was the chef, and, yeah. and and that was Patrick, and that was yeah. his food. I, I love that you intuitively knew that behind every great restaurant is a great person, and the restaurant has to be an extension of that person. It yeah. has to have that soul. Yeah. It can't be a thing. It has to have. It, you have to like put some. You have to. Uh, what's the word? Um, oh, the word when you give an inanimate ob object a human quality is personification. You personification. Know? You have to personify a restaurant. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely needs to have some some heart, some soul, personality. All those things are super important. And that and that's what really creates the vibe, which I think is the third part of, a, of an important triangle in the restaurant business. Food, 
service and vibe, mm. the environment, whatever that is. If it's fine dining, it may be very low key and tame and proper and prim. If it's Bruxy, as an example, it should be funky, cool, and and hip and yeah. fun and yeah. and uh, and and so that vibe piece is very important. But to do that, all the pieces sort of have to work together to make mm-hmm. that happen. Okay, beautiful. So um, I think we can kind of start to transition into Bruxy's now because he did spend about uh, eight years, seven years just consulting. Uh, you have. Uh, you were the president of uh, Chef Innovations Inc. You, to this day, you are president's so a big word. I, I founder. I, I was I was the I was the founder, which means I went and signed all the documents and created Chef Innovations Inc. and and uh, and was the chef and I I uh, did eight almost ten years of, of consulting actually okay. and the first consulting job technically really would have been the job I did in Dublin Ireland because I was hired away from Chicago to go move to Dublin Ireland and build a restaurant for a guy from the ground up. Okay. And so while I worked for him there. That's really where Chef Innovation started. I, I recognized while I was in Dublin that I was taking all, the culmination of all this exposure and experience that we just talked about, and I was building a restaurant from the ground up in a foreign country, mm. um, which was amazing experience for me. And it really solidified and helped me solidify all of those things that we just went through of however many years that was. And so I was able to sort of package that up. And when I was moving back in late 2001 to, to the U.S., that's when I recognized, mm, yeah, I can't go to work for a corporation. Yeah, um, I really want to help small businesses become more successful and streamlined. Yeah. And that's what Chef Innovations was born on is, is my ability to work with an independent operator and maybe put some systems in place for them, maybe write their recipes down yeah. for them, maybe help them out that way. Or restaurants that had two or three, uh, op- restaurant operators that had two or three restaurants that might want to franchise, but they weren't really set up to franchise. And so I would help them get ready for that that franchise. So you learned a lot role. about the franchise pro- uh, process then. Well, I, I, what I did was I knew that it, in order to grow, you sort of had to have a package of things so you could grow. And then I got hired by a franchise development company as, through Chef Innovations, but I was hired by them to go in and help their brands organize themselves and systemize. So that's where I really started. And that was probably 2000. Four maybe. Okay. That's where I really started to to learn about franchising and what it takes and how it differs from from corporate growth um, and and those kind of things. Okay. So what were some of the you said that you needed to package things? I needed these packagings. Like get specific. What what packaging? Did well, you need? starting with operations manuals, service manuals, uh, recipes. Um, order guides, teaching people how to how to organize themselves. Standardization. Standardization. Complete yeah. standardization of all Committing of those things. Committing to one way to do things. Committing to one way of doing things and a system for any type of changes you want to do. When you're an entrepreneur, you can just kind of roll in and decide I'm I'm making this you know kitchen sink kind of thing today. And hey, somebody go write that on the chalkboard and and uh, we're going to make that today. When you start to grow, you have to systemize all the standardize and systemize all those things, and you got to be prepared to roll it out to multiple locations and ideally hope fingers crossed that that it all kind kind of comes out about the same yeah so um what was the other thing that you mentioned the difference between franchises and corporations what, what was that what well were those corporate you growing corporately you have a lot of control yeah you can control everything you can you can say i want this special and i want it rolled out next week in all six of our restaurants and i want it run between these hours at this price um period Okay. In a franchise operation, you need to you have to a you need to be thinking about those things way in advance. You need to give your franchisees more more information. The franchisee becomes your new employee. Yeah, right? yeah, really, you begin you actually begin working for the franchisee. Yeah, just like and, it was an employee, like your job to give them the tools they need, right? I'm yeah, and further and further office. and and further in advance with more information. And you have to be a little bit more flexible with their input and and things of that nature. You just you're not their boss. We're you're, not. You're the, the partner. We're their partner, and we work for them. Mm. In the corporate environment, I can dictate what I want to dictate, and I can hold my people accountable. And if it doesn't get rolled out on Monday, I can get aggravated and do what I want to. Uh, with a franchisee. You got to be a little bit more pliable. Yeah, because I mean, they're an extension of your brand. If you are trying to, if you're like, you know, dictating to them, are they going to want to continue to show up and represent your brand the way you want them to? If they don't like you, you know, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Is that is that what you're alluding to? Yeah, but uh, to, to a degree, yes, uh, yes, that's accurate. Um, you just have to change the way you think 
and the way you manage. Okay. So what was going on in your life um, in 2009 or probably 2008, 2007 where you're like, I got something? Yeah, so I was I was consulting, and I have an old business, an old associate that I had done some work with back uh, in the in the URG days through uh, Produce, and we'd stayed in touch through the years, and uh, he had me doing some consulting for his produce company, and um, during that time he approached me with another product he was working on, and that was the waffle mix. Okay, um, and he came into my office and approached me with this waffle mix that he'd created and it was actually in a frozen form at the time and we talked about it and he asked me if I would test it and see what I thought. I gave him some feedback and he was transitioning into a, a powder form to make it easier and and so I gave him some input on that and, as, and while we were working through that he kind of kind of said to me, I may be paraphrasing, but he basically said, hey help me figure out a way to sell more waffle mix. And so I took that as a challenge and sort of had waffle mix on the brain. And, and I was working at the time with um, a Korean company, actually. They'd hired me to help um, um, sort of bring their menu to the U.S. and migrate it um, through some evolution and some American adaptations. And it was a fried chicken company. Uh, so I had fried ah, chicken. So I had marrying these. Parts well, of your so world. I, I have a waffle here, and I'm working with a fried chicken company. <laughs> yeah. And what's a culinary staple from the South? Fried chicken and waffles. Yeah. And so I'm thinking, well, how, you know, what could I do here? So actually, at one of my tastings, I did the waffle for them, but they didn't quite get it. And and I understand that they didn't understand the fried chicken waffle. And waffles in South Korea, by the way, are different. They're the sweeter, more street style Belgian waffle okay. called a Liège. So they were familiar with that, and they drink it, they eat them for snacks and have it with coffee. Okay. So they didn't quite get the, the chicken and waffle thing. But in May of that same year, I was in Korea uh, walking around with a couple franchise guys out of uh, New York eating street food, and we'd been to a Korean barbecue and had a couple of sojus and some beers, and we were out talking, and I was eating street food, and I had all this street food in my hands, and I had the waffle on the brain. And I'm kind of thinking, how can I, how can I get this waffle to uh, be this handheld thing that, that I could walk around with my cell phone or maybe a beer yeah. in my hand? Yeah. And, and it kind of hit me. You know, I, I should make a thinner waffle okay. and roll it or fold it or see what I could do with it. And I actually made a phone call that night from my hotel room uh, around 2 in the morning. It was something like uh, 10, 10 in the morning here the day before. Um, and I just had a conversation with my, uh, my associate at the time. And... Uh, asked him to get thinner plates. And so when I got back from Korea, um, he'd gotten thinner plates made. And we started playing with the waffle and making sure the recipe worked. And we still had that. Uh, our waffle is. When you say uh, plates, you're talking about the heater the, of the waffle. The, mold. the waffle grids, gotcha. the thing that makes the waffle pattern yep. that bakes them. Yep. Um, and we had to make sure that the waffle maintained its integrity with it being crispy on the outside and light and airy and kind of crepey on the yeah. inside. Um, and we got the recipe done to that. And I took the waffle baker with me and went to my kitchen and started putting stuff inside of it and folding it over. And I created a handheld waffle sandwich is yeah. what I created. And we were doing things like prosciutto and gruyere at the time and uh, uh, some other things. One of my favorite things was peanut butter and jelly because I like toasty bread with my yeah. peanut butter and jelly. And then we started playing around with different things and, and working in a test kitchen. And all of a sudden it, it, it dawned on me that our waffle was essentially fresh baked bread. It was mm -hmm. like pulling a fresh baguette out of a beautiful French oven yeah. and breaking it. You know how you get that crusty exterior and that soft, mm -hmm. steamy, delicious interior. Making me hungry. I'm and, definitely eating one of those sandwiches and after I had, recording. I had this epiphany that this is, this is bread. And so I started deconstructing sort of classic sandwiches uh, right down to a burger and some other things. And, uh, and, and then I, I basically took... A kind of a classic fried chicken and waffle dinner down deconstructed a little bit and then reconstructed it as a sandwich and from day one at Bruxy the the buttermilk fried chicken and waffle sandwich with the chili honey and the cider slaw has always been our number one selling sandwich yeah what I loved about what I love about your story and what when I, I first came across your story and the brand and what you're doing the, the thing that came to my mind immediately is just do one thing really well and if you can do one thing really well that you invented even better because yeah. now you're the best in the world yeah. at it yep. um, was that going through your mind at all you know when we opened this little location here I mean you you asked me a question a second ago when did you know you had something I don't know I had something and 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 by the way I I, I don't think that way yeah but at some point 
after our first month or two of Bruxy when the lines were down the street <laughs> and people were just thrilled and having a great time and I was working 18 hours a day every single day of the week and didn't mind it yeah i knew there was something there we knew there was something there so yeah i was curious because it it, uh, it makes sense now this time when you're consulting that you're doing franchising because the everything you're doing up to this point was very more fine dining more full service more big operations complex beasts yeah if you will it's fair to say right but, and then you it seems like almost like yours is like wisdom that finally kicked in that like if you want to make something and you want to do like to put all that energy into something more simple doing one thing really well and again i don't want to put words into your mouth i don't want to make assumptions but am i was this going on in your mind like I'm, yeah I'm well, not was, any younger i'll like, tell you what what the thought process was was okay a little fast casual thing with a small yeah. little menu that's very focused this could be fun and kind of relieve the pressure because fine dining is very very pressure filled yeah a maintaining quality is not an easy job mm-hmm. a b being creative constantly being creative can be taxing Mm -hmm. um when you're charging a lot of money in in a very uh high-end restaurant there's there's a higher level of expectation that you're always trying to achieve and ideally beat Mm -hmm. um it's taxing it's mentally and emotionally taxing so i'm thinking oh this could be a fun project well i'm going to tell you I didn't change. So the emotional drain and everything else was still taxing, <laughs> but it was fun. Mm-hmm. I will tell you that doing this doing this concept has been fun and it's been fun for 10 years. It's a fun concept. Yeah. It's chicken and waffles for goodness sakes. What, try and what say made that, it fun? Like what was going on that made it so much fun? Well, what try was say, try saying you know chicken and waffles and not smile to begin with or uh, you know, I mean it's it's hard to do. Yeah. Um, it's fun because it was unexpected. Mm-hmm. You know, we didn't sit around a table and invent Bruxy and go, okay, we got to do this many millions of dollars and we got to do this and that. We came into this little shack with an inexperienced team of people, um, people that had never cooked before. I mm-hmm. put back there to make waffles um, and, an in, and, and a crew of people who were going to Chapman University, caddy corner from us right now, that had never, uh, that had, never had jobs before. Mm. We took a, a small team of people. Um, uh, some of them had worked at a coffee house or something like that never in a restaurant um i came from fine dining i have very high quality expectations um it scared the heck out of me because the thought of putting food up in a window and having somebody pick it up and me never knowing if they enjoyed it or not scared the heck out of me because i'm very passionate and i take this very very personal and so we sort of uh, we sort of had to adapt some things. We adapted our service style because of that. We wanted to get to, I wanted to make sure that we were taking food to the guests. So we, we holler out names. Yeah. That made it fun. The guests didn't have to come get their food. We took it to them. Can we get you some ketchup? Go back and clear the table. And I want to know, I want to know if they ate everything. Mm-hmm. Tell me. And I had some people giving me feedback all day long. So, you know, we were humping it. We had something that was unique and special and definitely different. Um, and I think we exceeded people's expectations, and that just made me get out of bed every single morning and go home happy. Yeah, and I, I think it's necessary to bring the topic of brand positioning to the conversation because where you are, the whole brand, it, just everything that seems so on point. You're across the street from a college university. Literally, you might even be able to see it in the camera right now, and that's Possible. how close we are. Um was that going through the back of my mind? Like, this is going to be like our tar- like we're we're hitting our target market, young people. It's not necessarily like the healthiest food, so you need the younger right. people who are going to probably be not let so concerned about what they're consuming. I think it was more opportunistic than strategic. To be honest with you, we were looking for a space. We knew we wanted to do something. Um, I actually had initial fears that we were too far off of the Orange Circle, which okay. is down two blocks. Yeah. Um, I'm so happy we didn't go there. Okay. Um, this corner was dilapidated. The business was dilapidated. It worried me a lot. Um, however, um, we did we did think okay, well we got college students here, and you know we, this this should be popular with younger people because they're open minded and and adventurous. There was really a a bit of a trend going to uh, the adventurous uh, the younger adventurous yeah. eaters. So we we thought that 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 would resonate with them. I'll be honest with you though, our business most people thought the initial couple of years it was all Chapman students and college students, but it probably represented twenty twenty five percent of our business. Wow. What happened was social media was taking it, yeah. and 
and Yelp and other social media aspects are really what drove people, drove people from all over. So we had people coming from all over. We had a huge reach. Yeah. And so social media really helped Bruxy a lot. I mean, also, again, though, the, the significance of having a unique selling proposition, doing one thing and being the inventor of it and not being able to go anywhere else and get it is so powerful. Yeah, I probably, I, I mean, I'll exaggerate a little bit. Um, uh, we, I, we probably had a blogger here. I was going to say we probably had a blogger here every day that I was talking to. We probably had bloggers, a couple of bloggers here every single week. Wow. Um, because we were unique, it was different. Uh, we had a lot of Yelpers and high ratings on Yelp, which Yelp, Yelp uh, at the time made me nervous because I'm the type of, I'm the type of chef that uh, when we'd get a review, whether it was good or bad, I'm reading between the lines to find out what we could have done better. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me to go home at midnight after about 18 hours of being here and read Yelp reviews and have one three-star review uh, sent me into a tailspin. And, yeah. <laughs> and I, actually, I actually had to have Yelpers who were standing in line tell me, don't pay attention to that stuff. Yeah, you know, pay attention to the amount of the the rating and the amount of and the amount of reviews that that person does, or, or something like that. So, so actually, it took Yelpers to actually set my mind at ease. Were you being proactive with these bloggers and these these uh, influencers, trying to inviting them here, or were they finding you just now? Uh, probably a little bit of both. Yeah. But I had worked with uh, a, a fantastic lady in in PR on some of my projects that I had done consulting. And so I asked her to, to connect with me, and she was very excited about the concept. So she definitely helped us get a press release out and yeah. connect with some people. Is this but, Sarah? Is um, no, no, no. This is this is uh, somebody from from previous previous oh, yeah. uh, Bruxy life, but and still to this day friends and still engage with Bruxy. For context, Sarah is the person that I was working with to, to come here, so I was just curious. If it was the same right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, I was on the phone with Sarah. I think uh, recently. Yeah. Um, but no, Sarah. Sarah has come later, but Mona. Mona um, was a young lady that sort of helped kick us off and, and get some news out there about this new concept. But you, you know, once the social media train starts starts leaving the all station, it is all in. And, yeah. and we, had, we had bloggers in here all the time, and I spent the time with them, and I think they loved that. I, yeah. I cooked for them. We made special things for them. We let them into the kitchen. Um, I'd sit down like this and have conversations with them. Uh, we'd have events for them. We, we, we gave them the attention that I think – I maybe didn't even understand at the time that they needed or deserved, but that's just, I mean, that's who I am. That's yeah. my DNA. So you you opened that uh, in 2009. So we're going 2010. On 2010. November 8th, 2010. So we're 10 years into it. Um, I'm curious about scaling because you're at uh, seven locations now uh, and you're pushing hard right now for expansion. Yep. Um, what did that expansion from one to seven look like? When did you know it was time for number two? Yeah, well, number two came one year to the day um, in 2011. November 8th, 2011, we opened our Brea location. How uh, far is that from here? Uh, about uh, 10 miles. Okay. Not very far. Um, uh, downtown Brea. Um, we've got a great landlord over there we've had for uh, that amount of years. Uh, super supportive and was very interested. In, and I love our Brea location. Um, and then we had some interested investors and we took on some investment and we started to grow. But you said something a, a few minutes ago I want to come back to is is brand, I think you said brand identity. Brand um, positioning. I brand positioning. Yeah. So uh, mistakes we talked about earlier. Uh, you learn more from mistakes yeah. uh, and, and failures than you do from successes. Believe me, we've, we've made our share of mistakes and we've had some failures. And that's why I think, I, I think you've got to be uh, able to adapt and we're, I think we're better positioned now than we ever were for the growth because we've had those mistakes and we've learned. Let's lean into these mistakes. Identify one or two of these big mistakes that you, I like that you know you definitely attributed to whatever. Bruxy, um, Bruxy as a a waffle and waffle sandwich concept, fried chicken and waffle sandwich concept, um, was very very new. And so the excitement around Bruxy came from a lot of early adopters. Our successes came from early adopters, but there's only so many of those. So you have to be very, very strategic, I think, in where you go. Okay. Real estate selection and and how you position yourself and how you speak to people. So what didn't you do? Or what did you do that think, wasn't right? I think we over um, I think we oversaturated an area and cannibalized from ourselves. And the other thing that I think is more critical that we didn't do is we didn't pause and and kind of do a, an, an introspection of what are we selling, who are we talking to, as we start marketing, um, how should we speak to people, what are, what are what's the consumer telling us? What's our tone, what's our voice? Yeah, um, and, and for everything from 
name, tagline, logos, all those things I think people have to take a pause and evaluate. If, if for nothing else to just be sure that what you're doing is right, does resonate, and and is relevant to a broader market. So what tw- what did you tweak that, that helped you rebound from some of the hiccups you had? So we had a couple years where we were really in those growing pains. And truthfully, it's like growing up, right? You go yeah. through a spurt of all this uh, all this fun and work working hard and and growing and growing in multiple locations and uh, enjoying your success and and taking the punches with uh, with 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 every business. There's ups and downs and punches. Mm-hmm. Um, but we had a few years where we had to sort of take that pause and so we've had these uh, these seven restaurants for for several years so about four years ago uh, we took a real pause and started doing some of that introspection I think we were about three week three years too uh, late on that yeah but it is what it is right yeah you can't a, dwell on that that's a common uh, theme I picked up on a lot of successful brands they have a lot of success um, and then they think okay we know we have something um, but they take that time to really distill it and to, to get it down to rain to get that identity to, yep. to really be super crystal clear about who they are because as you get bigger as you scale that ship grows and bigger ships don't pivot as quickly yep. so you got to be you got to hone it in that's right because as because because it's going to be a lot harder to change later on yep. once you scale that's right and so it was about four four and a half years ago we really sort of took a screeching halt it was right around the time we opened our Las Vegas location about four years ago. Okay. So as we were going into the Las Vegas location, it was time to kind of go, wait, we got we just got to pull back here a little bit. We really have to identify who we are, what we are. And we did a, we, we brought in a branding expert. We did some, some introspection, some analysis, looked at some consumer data. What, what, what did this branding expert bring to your attention that you weren't aware of? Uh, who... Really, it's who 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 are you? Who do you want to be when you grow up? Who do you think you're speaking to? Well, here's what the data tells us, and and is your messaging on point? And and we had some messaging that wasn't on point. Uh, we changed our logo, our tagline, um, revised the lo- the revised the logo or the, the the name a little. Well, Bruxy's always been the name. Can you get a little more specific as to like what where you were and what you were saying? Like what like what was the where were you not making your mark? Or landing, landing yeah, the market. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the consumer. Well, here I'll give you a point. The, we were we were, we had a bigger menu. We we kept growing the menu to try and grow into certain markets. Okay. Rather than staying focused on exactly what we are, and you've said it a couple times through our conversation, focus on w- yeah. w- one thing and do it really really well. Well, our fried chicken and waffle sandwich. I said it earlier. Since day one, has been the number one selling sandwich. Yep. When we really started peeling apart the data, the fried chicken and waffle sandwich. Let's just say if we looked at a period of time and we sold 5,000 fried chicken and waffle sandwiches, the next highest selling sandwich was 1,000. Yeah. Five to one. Yeah. And then everything else sort of fell underneath that. Yep. So you got to kind of go, hmm, what's resonating with people? And it was the third item on the menu, I think. Okay. It wasn't even the number one item on the menu or the top item on the menu at the time. So we really had to start going. What's the data say? What's the data telling us we are? and What's resonating with people? Yeah, we we love our waffle sandwiches and we love our burger and we love doing this and we love doing that. And some of those still remain. But do we need all this other noise? Mm. And or should we be looking at extending the fried chicken sandwich menu, which yeah. is what I started doing? Gotcha, gotcha. Adding a basic crispy, doing a, at the time a Nashville hot, um, maybe ahead of maybe ahead of everybody else doing Nashville right. hot. Yep. Um, um, doing chicken tenders really resonated with the younger yep. the younger clientele. Yep. Um, so we started to expand on the fried chicken, still honing in on the waffle sandwich, and then we started looking at you know other things. What are these things selling? Should they drop away? Um, how do we when we do our LTOs and our promotions? Should they be other things or should What's they? What's an LTO? Uh, limited time offer. Gotcha. So we do our limited time offers or our promotions. Should it be focused in the fried chicken category? Should it be doing something else? So we really had to learn a lot, and we learned a lot that year, four years ago. We really we really pulled a lot of stuff together. We had a lot of conversations, some of them harder than others, um, and we really tried to learn a lot from that. Yeah, Kelly, this has been a great conversation. Uh, I want to respect your time. We're at an, an hour and 17 minutes of recording time give or take um anything we haven't gotten to this to that you're hoping we would discuss or anything that you're you're wanting to discuss well we've laid a lot of groundwork but i want to make sure we really talk about where bruxy is going and where it should or where it should be going okay and and uh just kind of focus 
in on that because as I said a few minutes ago, I think I, I think now I feel really good. I've been involved before Bruxy um, in, in the inception. Uh, I, I worked every day in this little shack for a long, long time, um, developing and, and being in touch with the concept. Uh, we worked through the openings. Uh, we went through the trials, tribulations, um, and and sort of the the uh, I don't really know if rebirth is the right the right call or not. But we tried to learn from those mistakes and really learn who we want to be as we grow up. We're poised better than ever right now for that growth. Okay. And and by that I mean we know who we are. We know who we want to be in business with passionate people that that have a respect for quality and, and want to be in a different space um, because we're not like anybody yeah. else yeah um one thing you've alluded to a couple times is that you're not corporate you don't like big business you don't do well in big business you're better in the the um smaller environment is more, more resonates with you it's something that i picked up throughout the conversation how do you plan on tackling that hurdle because it's gonna it's gonna be more and more difficult as yeah. you get bigger so we 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 have a team of people so a lot of what i'm saying there is that's that's just me personally that's my dna yeah and where i thrive and function best so we have a team of people that that run the office is we have a ceo we have a cfo um we have an awesome vice president of operations now um so and, and they're all focused, by the way, on developing the, the franchise side of the business okay. so we can support the franchise group. And, and everyone we've brought on in the past year, year and a half has come from the franchising business because we believe that's where our growth model is. Okay. For me, it's great to see because I get to act as the founder and the chef. And so I, you know, I get to be a little bit of the showman. Yep. I'm very involved every day in food and operations, um, but really it's from the, the sort of creative side as well as the maintaining the integrity yeah. of what we started side. Yeah, and there's an underlining lesson in there. And do what you do really well. Know your lane and surround yourself with the people that are strong. When you're oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely know your know your lane and stay in it. Yeah, <laughs> stay sure. in yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. You you you. You, I tell you what, you can kind of pull out of it a little bit, but hopefully you've surrounded yourself with people that kind of keep you back yeah. in your lane. Chef Kelly, you've given us you've given us gold. But is there anything you want to get out? Any last thing you want to get out? Any of that last nugget, words of wisdom before we go to the speed round? Well, I think oh, the speed round, yeah, get me all scared. I I think I guess a few things I've said is is. There, there is an old adage that uh, overnight successes take years and years and years to happen. Yeah. And I think that's that's very true. And I think everybody should keep that in mind. Yep. And it, it just doesn't it just doesn't happen. It takes a lot of hard work. Some good experience helps. And if you're lucky enough and remember what we said about luck, opportunity meets preparedness. Um, if you're if you're lucky enough to have those two things merge, be prepared for a lot of hard work because it isn't easy. Yeah. I mean, I work, I work very hard to this day, 10 years into this project. I work very hard as does the team around us. Um, but it's, it takes a lot of hard work. You got to love the work. You got to love and the you process. have to love the work. Yeah. You know what? That's a really good point. Thanks for saying that. You really do need to love the process. And I'm, I'm very fond of saying that, uh, this business excites me. I like the business to be fun. When my feet hit the ground every morning, I want to go to work. And, and it's fun. I love the people we hire. I love the people that come into our restaurants. And I love what we're doing. I mean, I just think we're doing something unique and special here. I and I, I, I want it to get out to more people. Yes. Um, and this is a question I've been asking all my guests recently uh, before going to the speed round. Uh, the mission statement is to inspire, empower, and transform the industry. So how have you transformed as a professional? Who are you today versus the man you were getting started? Oh, that's a tough. That's uh, that's. It's probably not as tough as I think to answer, but uh, I, I mean, you certainly garner a lot when you've got a broad amount of experience. Um, I think I'm more patient. I've always been very passionate, but I think I've learned how to channel that passion. Um, I've definitely learned how to be more patient. I will tell you that the question I get a lot, and I, I want to make sure I get it in here, is people ask me often what, what gives me the greatest pleasure. And it's the greatest pleasure I've ever gotten is when someone that I've worked with through the years has come back to me mm. and thanked me. What or, you did for your chef. Gertz. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, when they've come back and thanked me or I've run into them randomly at a food show or something and they introduced me to their new boss or business partner or wife or whatever and and, and introduced me as a person that inspired them to get into the business. Um, 
I, I think helping other people grow yes. in the business is is the greatest pleasure I've ever gotten out I of I can business. relate to that. Yeah. Man. I absolutely I love it. Great stuff. One more quick break to thank our sponsors. We'll be right back to dive into a speed round. This episode brought to you by Margin Edge. Never deal with a paperwork nightmare again. All right, we're back. And the first question I have for you is what is your it factor, a habit, a trait? Probably work ethic. Work ethic. I love it. What is your biggest weakness? Um, overthinking things. <laughs> yeah. We just talked about yes. that. Uh, what is one question you ask or thing you look for when you're building your team? How are you recruiting? What's that look like? Um, one thing I ask when I'm recruiting. Maybe a job interview really, or something like that. Really, it's, uh, it's personality. Mm. It, it's personality. I love it. Uh, what is one of your biggest challenge challenges today? Um, finding the right people. Yeah, and uh, how are you dealing with that? Uh, well, you got to, sorry to, sorry to say it, but you got to kiss a lot of frogs, right? <laughs> yeah, that's I true. mean, you just got to talk to people and, and look for the right, look for the right traits. Share one code of conduct or behavior you're looking or you're, you're teaching your team. This is a core value, a way to be, a way to yeah, act. Yeah, I guess I'd have to say lead by example. Mm, I love it. And what is one uncommon standard of service you teach your team? So this is something that's common within your businesses to go above and beyond, but not common within the industry. Um... Ooh, I mean, I would always say, and, and this may not answer your question, but um, I, my goal is always to exceed the guest's expectation. How you do that um, is is read the guest and always try to anticipate what they need. Yes, yes, I love that. Um, what is one book that's a that will make us a better person or restaurant owner? Mm, mm, mm. I mean, a cliche book would be Seven Habits and um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Yeah, and, and habit number five. Um, Seek, seek first to understand and then yes, be understood. It's been, a, been an ongoing. Thing <clears throat> yeah, before. so that, and that's kind of cliche, but it, it is one that sort of resonates with me. Yep. Uh, what is one thing you feel restaurateurs don't do well enough or often enough? Listen. Yes. Uh, name one service you've hired or outsourced to make your brand better uh, or your business better, to improve you some way, somehow. Oh so this isn't the technology. It's an expert. It's an authority on a subject. Somebody you outsource to to come in and to make you better. And we're specifically talking about Bruxy? Yes. Okay. Uh, or anything that comes to mind. You already mentioned the branding person you work with. Yeah, and, and she's done a great job with us. In my past, um, I've been to uh, been involved with a couple of uh, leadership thing, leadership uh, clinics that we've put on for our teams that have done well f- to, to help me. Um, Can you think specifically, the point of this question is to refer good people to good people. Oh, I don't have one on the tip of my tongue. Sorry. Can you think of the woman that was helping you with your branding? Oh well, Pam Cunningham. Yeah. In her business. Um, uh, I don't know if she's going to want me to tell you that because she's very, she's very focused and very picky about who she works okay. with. Okay. All right. But uh, but but Pam's been great to really help us think. I'm trying to throw a business her away. Yeah, I know she want. She, <laughs> she doesn't need that. it. No. <laughs> we need her. Right. <laughs> All right. Um, Name one technology you've outsourced or you've you've re- used in your business, you've implemented in your business. Yeah, so I'm going to speak operationally for me yep. as a chef. Is uh, I had to migrate uh, several years ago to uh, kitchen display systems away from printed tickets. And, okay, and and uh, that's pretty simple in, in to some degree, but it operationally was a, uh, an epiphany. In the the company that you went to 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 implement this at the technology? time, we used our point of sale, there uh, our point of sale company, but um, there is a company called. QSR that okay. does that. That's highly t- highly technical and does a great job with um, kitchen display systems. Beautiful. And this is the last question. It's a doozy. Get ready for Uh-oh. it. Uh-oh. If you got the news, you'd be leaving this world tomorrow. All the memories of you, your work, and your restaurants would be lost with your departure. But you could leave three pieces of wisdom behind for the good of for the the good of humanity and your legacy. What would those three pieces of wisdom be that you could leave behind? Uh, um, well, be, uh, be, <laughs> uh, this is it's tough. a deep one. It's a deep it, one. It I is deep. The easy questions. To, to, to start with, be kind. Yes. Uh, be good to people. I love it. Um, I think that's super important. That's uh, be open, be open-minded. You, got, you have to be open-minded. Um, and, and, uh, don't be afraid to fail. Um, but. But uh, learn from those failures and be uh, be able to adapt and evolve to be successful. That's three, but I feel like you might 
wanted to say something else. I don't want to cut you short. Uh, no, I think that's, okay. uh, th- th- that's good. I, I, do, I, I guess I would say find, find the thing that makes you happy and be very passionate about it. Yes. And, and, and you'll, you, know, you will be happy and, and, and do better. I love it. Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, it's been a great time talking to you. We wrap up every chat by calling somebody out. That's how I find my future guest. Who is somebody that you respect and admire and know would make a great guest mentor like you made for us today? Somebody who's doing it right. Oh man, not within my own business, um, or within the restaurant business, but oh, I should have, I should have, I should have had this one rehearsed. There's so many people going through my mind. You can drop multiple. The more, the merrier. It's all about helping me connect with the next person to make an example of. Um, well, there's a gentleman that I respect a lot um, named Matt Stein, okay. who's a chef and uh, actually works with King's Fish House these days. Okay. Um, super passionate, uh, super knowledgeable. Um, somebody Matt have, Stein. Matt Stein, Matthew Stein. Um, there's a gentleman named Harold Herman that I have a lot of respect for, who was the one of the founders of uh, Yard House okay. that I think um, uh, he and I connect well on a cultural and... Uh, and uh, maybe emotional level when it comes okay. to the restaurant business and how we treat people. That's a couple. So Matt and Harold, look out. I'm coming after you. <laughs> I would love to get you on the show. And uh, how can we connect with you or Bruxy to inquire about maybe franchising? Because you guys are expanding. You're looking for good people. If this episode has resonated with you and you're interested, what's the best way to connect? Uh, well, we have a website. Bruxy.com, and then there's a franchising d- division of the website, but you can get on our regular website, franchise uh, Bruxy.com, and uh, click on the franchising. And th- that's B R U X I E dot com. That's correct. Um, there's lots of contact information on there. Our uh, our the person in charge of development is John Ramsey, um, but info at Bruxy.com probably works just as well. That's an easy one to remember. Yep. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully, we hear from lots of uh, great operators out there that want to. Help us expand this uh, this awesome concept. Yeah, and this is episode seven hundred and seven. I hope I'm not getting too ahead of myself. I'm pretty sure that's what it's going to be. Head over to restaurants unstoppable slash seven oh seven, and you can find a summary of today's discussion as well as any links to tools, services, or books recommended. Chef Kelly, I can't express enough. Thank you so much for taking the time to My sit pleasure. with me to. to wiggle your schedule around uh, and to to make time to share your story. There is no questioning. You are unstoppable. Ah, you're awesome. Cheers.